Hi, I'm Navid, and uh, so the title of the talk is Chaosing into Balance, Palinomorphic, Osmosis, Plenum being the stuff of the world, morphing into modes of understanding. Uh, since Shinbei's departure from the topological media lab, I've been uh, co-directing the lab. In this talk, I won't be covering uh, everything the lab does, but instead I will be focusing on two more personal projects that happen to have some lessons for living architectures in my view. So as a token or as a nod to Shinbei uh, in his talk, uh, since, uh, again, the director, uh, our founder's departure, we've been working with this sort of shift from representation to performance, but in particular, moving towards computational matter as, as a way of co-articulating event dynamics. Uh, this becomes relevant to living architectures because instead of uh, working with cognitive agents in human notions of what it is to be living or have a neural system or et cetera, we could not introduce uh, notions that are from the domain of the observer into event dynamics and work with them. This doesn't make the system uh, unfriendly to humans. We can always maneuver embodied intuition as we always have. Okay. So the first work I'd like to visit is aquaphonia. And aquaphonia is an alchemical assemblage that transmutes the voice into matter. In this case, transmutes your voice into water. Referencing the history of sound recording uh, with this Edison horn that used to etch your voice into a wax cylinder, we're projecting uh, your aqueous voice into a speculative future where we're dreaming of this alchemical matter where your voice is liquid. And you, in such a world where you don't have to work with the separation of sounds from their sources while you're processing them, schizophonia, you could, then you would have to work with the tempi of matter. So if you want to get a drone scape, you would have to boil it. If you want to get something rhythmic, you could drip it. Uh, instead of, again, adding uh, smartness to material events. So uh, this means a shift from spatialization to localization. Uh, to be clear, there's nothing against spatialization. As a composer, I've worked with many institutions with higher order ambisonics, spherical harmonics, and whenever I'm working with sound as an abstract medium, that's absolutely great. Same way if you're working with cinema, you want to get high definition visuals. But when you want to synthesize living matter, uh, you have to really think about sound as a phenomena that's materially bound, not just in the way it interacts with the space, but right at its source. Where does it come from? Uh, so we want to be in touch with the sexy flux of matter at its source again. Uh, so this means that we could maybe perhaps work with structure-borne sound, and structure in the sense that Merleau Ponty put forth in structure of behavior where you don't have an excitation and response, but where excitation and response co-emerge, as does the organism, as the outside and inside, the outside being already inside, and the response being already the excitation itself. So you could think the same in our sonic metaphors and sound design. Uh, then also, we could sense structurally, too. So instead of having inputs that go through our certain modes of processing, we could work with structure-born sense. Uh, in this case, sound becomes another great medium because you could work with structural vibration as your input itself. Um, and then you could, uh, so then with aquaphonia, we're synthesizing this sonal alchemical matter. Uh, I will let you watch a video that's about a minute long.
Hello. 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 Hey. Hello. 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 is that the sound is coming as abstract from above, whereas in this piece uh, there's something about 50 actuators and different modes of sensing uh, the temporal textures of materials, and then the action happens where you see it, not from a schizophrenic speaker. Uh, so that's key. So I will go to another project that furthers my research into computational materials and co-articulating compositions with them. This one is more in the art science realm. So whereas aquaphonia was projecting a conceptual uh, future and synthesizing alchemical matter, this one, uh, we're working with a physical and rarely seen phenomena in the style of tabletop cosmologies. And uh, we're engaging with art and science both as rigorous phenomenology in the way that it was put forth by Husserl and then picked up by others later. Uh, and then by that I mean we would critically engage in the place of experience and sense in our investigations and measures. Uh, for example, when you look at living systems, uh, naive science, as in non-contemporary science, would, for example, measure events. But when we deal with biology, we would measure something and it doesn't add up to consciousness and we have that in us. So, we be, so we, the place of experience becomes, became a starting point at the turn of the century to realize that uh, it can help us. And then also, we have to uh, subtract our structure of perception from what you see. So this is something that both sciences and arts critically engage with. In this project, called Tangible Flux Polymorphic Chaosmosis, um, I'm investigating laws of complex harmonic motion, starting with a single magnetic ball that you could hold within your two fingers. And then these balls uh, would basically, under magnetic flux, they would um, fall behind and they would search for a minimal energy state. But being spheres themselves, they would turn around and that would add a second oscillation, thus creating complex harmonic motion. So this was an accident. What you see in the middle is actually from my video at 4 a.m. where a magnetic steer got sticky and then I realized this pattern emerged and I knew something is interesting. And I started investigating and I realized what you see in all these videos, the same phenomena, but here kinetically happening, where two oscillations interact to create what we know as the beginning of chaos theory and unpredictability and perhaps uh, emergence of vibrant materials. And uh, maybe that could point to the intersection between non-life and life, uh, at least within complexity sciences. So whereas the sciences and some arts would take something like this, theorize it, measure it, and represent it, um, whether it's Zanakis, Max Ernst, uh, nonlinear astrophysics, uh, complexity studies, chaos theory, etc., I'm more interested in bringing the senses into play. So um, what we have is that the person would be, is standing here on a platform that's vibrating uh, with haptification of the phenomena. So you feel what you see, and then what you see through uh, LEDs is augmented to almost look more virtual. But as a composition, what's composed is not the forms. The forms are emergent. It's the states of your sensory access to the phenomena, making the partiality of your perception becoming aware of itself, AKA uh, emerge, onset of hallucination in a phenomenologically interesting way. So you could investigate your own perceptions. Um, so the systems are simple. There's motors, actuators, and the emergence of the event. And the software is complicated not because what is made is complicated, but to piggyback right on the computational properties of matter to begin with. Uh, so I won't go into technicalities of it, but basically we're trying to use, a, this is for example a sonification diagram. So then to sonify the event instead of adding sound to it, we're trying to zoom into the micro performances of the material events and giving them voice to them. So there's three microcosms. Before showing you a one minute long video, um, 
I will quickly show you what you're going to see. So with microcosm number one, there's a single ball under an unstable magnetic field, and it's trying to find the minimal energy state, goes under laws of complex harmonic motion. Microcosm number two, there's many balls, each of a different color, and together they search for a minimal energy state, and they form these atomic topologies. And microcosm number three adds uh, fluid dynamics going between objects and fields. Okay, so I will conclude with a one minute long video. Uh, so this was presented as Art Electronica and recently in Zagreb. <laughs> I don't know if there's any questions. You mentioned along, along the way something about measurement, measurement. And uh, Giuseppe Longo said once that at the beginning of every science, the science has to decide or say what is measurable. And that determines the science because it then it starts building instruments to make that aspect of the world visible and other aspects become invisible. And I think what's really beautiful about this work, like Aquaphonia, for example, also the other work, is that it seems like, I'm going to ask you the question. Are, where are the points where you think of your devices as making a measure? Or maybe there are no parts, but if it's making a measure or observation, then what's, who's the observer? What's the observer? Um, OK, so I might not have a straight answer to that, like straightforward. But uh, what's interesting, what I wanted to explore is to see, uh, for example, to explore where we're inputting something that becomes part of measurement that's from the domain of the ex uh, observer versus from the domain of experience and from the domain of our senses. So these works suspend our sensory access to the phenomena. So then we could become aware of the, uh, let's put it this way, so uh, of, the performance, uh, of the performance that's taking place in measurement. So science would take a, a phenomena, perform it, and then perform, again, our states of sensory access to it, whether we're actually observing or not, turning them into data, reproducing it, creating a fact that becomes a fact because it's reproducible. And what I'm interested in is not this reproducibility, but this performance itself becoming apparent to the observers. So instead of having access to a fact, they could have access to how facts are performed themselves. And this is what I mean by rigorous phenomenology, because that allows us to then enter to how these facts are performed and think critically about where we can call something a fact or where it's actually pointing not to what we're seeing, but something about us, if there is a difference. But at least we want to be aware of that constantly, if you want to be rigorous as scientists, artists, designers. Thank you.